Hey guys, welcome back to Trinity Bible Church's online service. I'm so happy you're here. I am Liz. I am the children's ministry director here at Trinity Bible Church, and I am your host while we are here online together. Uh, as always, you can come here for the premiere, or you can meet live on the lawn. Right now is at nine o'clock, but starting November 1st, we're going to shift things a little bit. Our premiere here is usually at nine o'clock in the morning on Sunday, but starting November 1st, we're actually going to shift to 1030 in the morning. And it's the same with the live on the lawn. So if you want to join us here or there, whichever one, it's going to be 1030 instead of nine o'clock in the morning starting November 1st, which is also when daylight saving time ends. So extra sleep for everybody, right? Um, let us know that you are here with us today, as with every Sunday. Uh, fill out the Connect card online. It's trinitybible.link slash connect to fill out the Connect card. Give us just some information and let us know how we can be praying for you. And we would just love to hear from you and know that you're there. A uh, couple announcements real quick before we jump into worship. Our Trunk or Treat is coming up really quick. It's on October 30th here at the church at 6 o'clock in the evening. And uh, we have so many people signed up. It's really, really fun. I'm so excited. If you are still interested in signing up for a parking spot to decorate and socially distance hand out candy, the uh, registration for that ends on the 20th. So you have a couple more days to decide and fill that out. If you have any questions, go ahead and send me an email at Liz at, fellow, or Liz at TrinityBibleChurch.com. And uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. And the last announcement we have is we're having a picnic today here at the church at noon. So you still have time if you're watching this during the premiere at nine o'clock to get your picnic stuff, come on up to the church. We're going to be on the East Lawn, spread out, just enjoying each other's company here in the hopefully sunshine. So join us. And uh, with all that, let's have some fun worship time. Let us sing the lion and the lamb. He's coming. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Every day. 
So 
saves. You are the one that rescues me. You rescue me. you indeed rescue us from the grave, that the very death that we deserve due to our sin was taken, was covered by the death of Christ on the cross. And Lord, we thank you for Christ's resurrection, that we are able to know you because of him. And Lord, we pray that as we go into this next week, as we prepare ourselves for what is to come, that you may be the center of our focus. Be with us now as we look to your word and that we may come to know you more through it. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This morning, if you're joining us for our premiere, sure glad to see you. Thanks for making this part of your Sunday morning routine. It means a lot for us to be able to gather in this way, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be with you. And uh, so thanks for joining us. If you're not uh, right here at the premiere, but you're watching this later on Sunday or later in the week, thanks for building it into your routine. It's a healthy spiritual habit, and it's one of the ways that we st stay connected with uh, God and we stay connected with each other. So thanks for being present here. Now, today we're going to continue our study in Philippians, and uh, what we're going to see is that Paul is not done yet. Paul has been camping on a single theme for almost since the beginning of September, it seems, this, this humble, selfless sacrificial mindset that should uh, embody, that the Jesus followers should embody. And we're calling that selfless, humble uh, mindset. We're calling it gospel posture. And this is still his subject, even today, in our passage. Now, for those of us who live in the 21st century, we're used to uh, things moving a lot faster. We're used to changing subjects. Maybe you're ready for Paul to be done with this subject. Move on to something else. After all, we've been talking about this for weeks uh, and we don't always have the same the, the attention span for these more extended discussions. But I'm glad that Paul is not done yet, because as a pastor, I know that uh, it we usually take more than one sermon to change. Uh, we don't necessarily change just because of one message that we hear uh, or one encounter that we have with Scripture. Sometimes our new habits and new behaviors they take time. Actually, most of the time new habits, new patterns, new ways of thinking. They take time. It takes time for us to reflect on, on uh, what we see in ourselves. Time's, time for us to reflect on and, and become self-aware. Time for us to see ourselves the way God really sees us. And then, of course, it takes time to make adjustments. And uh, when we flit from one subject to the other and we move on to one, uh, you know, one thing before we're finished with the first, then we, we don't always get a chance to change. And our knowledge begins to outpace our obedience. But when we slow down and simmer, 
like we have to do when we go through Paul's writings here in Philippians, that's good for us because it gives us time to reflect, it gives us time to adjust, it gives us time to implement. And uh, so Paul's extended emphasis on gospel posture here is good for us. And I am praying that it will uh, have a lasting change on Trinity Bible Church. That it will produce a, that this period of time in the fall of 2020, that we're talking about these, these important issues, that they will produce a lasting change in our body that God will use for good. And uh, all of that to say that today, Paul's going to continue what, what he's been talking about, his discussion of gospel posture. And uh, here's the progression of thought so far. We're going to be in the, like, right at the, the middle of chapter 2. But uh, what Paul's going to be, Paul has been talking about this since chapter 1. And so let me give you a quick context of where we're at when we pick up our reading. We're going to begin reading in uh, chapter 2. Uh, but, but it's in chapter 1, verse 27, that Paul introduces his thesis. And you remember that statement. He says, uh, I want you to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's his thesis. Live worthy lives. Then in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he shows us what that looks like. He says, uh, he describes it. So the first the thesis statement, then the description of what this, this looks like, this worthy life. Uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's the description. Then the very next thing he does is he gives us the ultimate example of that. That's the Christ hymn that follows, that we looked at last week, that Christ hymn, the ultimate example of gospel posture. And then we get to today's passage, where Paul makes a personal appeal. So we go from his thesis to a description, to an example, to an appeal. And I'd like to read that passage today. But I'd like to begin with the same passage we've begun with every Sunday, that passage in chapter 2. But in this case, it actually leads right into today's passage. So I want you to reflect on this with me, watch this progression of thought, and then notice the very first thing, Paul, the appeal that Paul gives us right after we read the Christ hymn. So we're going to begin reading in chapter 2, verse 3. And it starts out like this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold forth the word of life. In order, that I may, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. 
before we start at the beginning of this passage and work our way through, and you'll need to keep your Bibles open for that. Before we do that, I want you to notice what we, this picture at the end, this word picture that Paul gives us of his life and his ministry. He talks about his life in verse 17 as a drink offering. And this is a reference to uh, the practice that uh, Jews in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant would practice when they would uh, take wine and pour it on the ground as an offering to God. And Paul uses that picture. I mean, who, who wants to take wine and pour it on the ground? But Paul uses that picture of poured out wine as a picture of his life, of total dedication, total emptying. And, and that's, that's a poured, a poured out life. And that's a great picture of Paul's life. It's also a picture of Jesus' life just preceding a poured out life. And it's a picture of the life that Paul is calling the believers in Philippi and us by extension to live a poured out life like a drink offering. And Paul is, is a painting this picture because th this is just another way of framing gospel posture. Uh, gospel posture is a poured out life. And as Paul appeals to these believers to live this kind of poured out gospel posture life. He gives us three reasons in this passage that we should do this. We're going to look at each of those three reasons. But first, I want you to notice at the beginning of the passage, verse 12, the subject. Paul says, as you have always obeyed. Paul is going to continue to exhort uh, these believers to obey. He wants us to obey. Well, what does he mean obey here? Paul says a lot of things in a lot of epistles about what obedience looks like. But in the book of Philippians, up to this point, obedience really means one thing. It means this attitude of gospel posture. That's obedience because that's the subject in Philippians. So he's reiterating the need to practice this mindset of humility and self-sacrifice and selflessness, concern for others. That's what obedience is here. And Paul gives us three reasons that we should practice this. And the first, and really the easily the most important if you were going to rate them, is found at the beginning of the passage. And Paul says that if we, we, we are to live with gospel posture, we are to live this kind of poured out life, because honestly, this is what God expects of us. Paul uh, describes the poured out life as, uh, verse, seven, uh, verse 12, con continuing to work out your salvation. Uh, living the poured out life is simply uh, working out our salvation. Now, don't misunderstand this statement as, a, uh, as telling us how we get saved. This is not a statement about how we get salvation because we know we don't work for our salvation. God gives us uh, eternal life. He forgives our sins and rescues us and adopts us into his family as his children, which we'll see here in a minute. Uh, he does that solely on the basis of our faith in Jesus, the one who died and was raised for our forgiveness of sins. It's solely uh, belief, confidence, faith in Jesus. It's not any kind of work that we perform to get salvation or to keep salvation. So this is not a statement about how to get salvation. This is a statement on how to live out our salvation. Paul means that we are to live out the implications of our salvation. That's what it means. Work out or live out your salvation. Continue the trajectory that God began in you when he saved you. Continue that trajectory because God saved us. God wants to have a people on earth who reflect him accurately to the world. And so Paul says, get on it. Uh, God saved you so that he would have people who reflect him, who are humble and selfless and self-giving. So get on it. That's the trajectory of your salvation. Live out your salvation in this obedient gospel posture. That's uh, God expects it. Uh, there's more about God expecting this from us. Uh, we continue to read. It says, uh, work out your salvation. Live out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, here Paul is, again, appealing to Christians who are God's people, 
who see God for who he is. Of all humanity, it's Jesus' followers who see God for who he really is and who take him seriously. And Paul says, listen, as people who take God seriously, who relate to him or should relate to him with fear and trembling, or uh, the Net Bible says awe and reverence, and really as uh, children of God, we don't relate to God with fear and trembling. The rest of the world does, but we relate to God with awe and reverence. And, and Paul says, listen, uh, you need to continue that attitude of awe and reverence. And you remember that this passage flows right out of the Christ hymn that ends with Jesus being acknowledged. uh, Every knee bows in heaven and on earth and under the earth just to make sure we've covered all the bases and confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. So already we have this cosmic scene. Jesus Christ is Lord and everyone will acknowledge that. And then... Uh, we have God the Father, who our passage, who the end of that hymn says, uh, gets the glory of all that. Every, every, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we have this cosmic scene here, and the result of that should be you and I relating with awe and reverence to who God is. And out of that awe and reverence, that, that true understanding of who God is, living out our salvation and conducting ourselves with gospel posture. So uh, we, we see more of the, the God reason that we are to uh, obey with gospel posture. And, and uh, we're reminded of one more reason in verse 13, where Paul reminds us that we can't do this on our own. For it is God who works in you to will and to do his good purpose. So Paul reminds us that the carrying out of this gospel posture, the, the live out your salvation, continue the trajectory that God started, that also, just like our initial salvation depended on God alone, this also is dependent on God alone to work in us, to desire and to carry out, to implement this gospel posture. But, but that provision is there. God does provide us with the, the uh, God does work in us to will and to act. And if God works in us to will and act, then it's pretty obvious that he wants us to do that. So, we are to live lives of gospel posture. Uh, we are to live poured out lives because God expects us to. He's equipped us to do that. He wants us to carry that out. And all of this, again, adds up to God's glory. It says, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. That's what all this adds up to, and that's what God expects. That's why he saved us. He saved us to reflect him to the world. He wants us to do that in gospel posture. Humility, self-sacrifice, love for others. There's a second reason in this passage that we are to uh, live gospel posture lives, poured out lives, and it's found in verses 15 and 16. And it says this, uh, we'll start in verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. The second reason that Paul wants us to live with gospel posture is because it's what the world needs from us. It's what God expects of us, but it's also what the world needs from us. Paul says we are to behave this way. Uh, Specifically, behave this way means do everything without complaining or arguing. That's another slant on gospel posture. And we're to do this because this is, this is how we become blameless and pure. Now, this is, I thought you said, you know, you might say, hey, I thought we were already blameless and pure. Uh, God forgave us our sins through Jesus. Well, yes. And we are to live out the trajectory that he, be, that he began in us when he saved us. So when, when we 
uh, become blameless and pure, we are living out the trajectory, closing the gap between what God has made us in Jesus and how we conduct ourselves. And, and as we do that, we live out our salvation more and more in the direction of this behavior. And as we do this, uh, you may become blameless and pure, children of God. Again, children who look like their father, who reflect him to the world. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold forth the word of life. That word of life, a beautiful way of putting the message of the gospel, the truth of Jesus, uh, God in a body who came and lived and died who modeled gospel posture and then rose again from the dead and was exalted by God so that and, and, and through him we have forgiven sins. That is the word of life, and that is the good news that we are to bring to the world. But Paul says that our ability to do this well rides on how we conduct ourselves. Notice the contrast here that's supposed to exist between the behavior of, of people who belong to God and the world that we live in. So God's children, it says here, children of God. So blameless and pure. That's the first part of the contrast. We're blameless and pure. We're children of God. We are without fault in the world. That's us. Children of God, blameless and pure, without fault in the world. And here we, we are in a world that is, according to uh, Paul here in verse 15, crooked and depraved, a crooked, depraved generation. So blameless and pure, crooked and depraved. Now, that's the contrast that is supposed to exist between Jesus' followers and the world. And if we are working out our salvation, the salvation that makes us unique and sets us apart, then our behavior should be unique and set us apart. And Remember what this behavior is, this behavior here that distinguishes us from the world. Paul is not talking about smoking and drinking here. Paul's not even talking about sexual immorality here. What Paul is talking about is our relational behavior, how we treat each other. He's talking about our disposition towards one another especially, and all people. But he's talking about us being gracious and humble and loving with our words and with our attitudes. And that's the behavior that he says stands out in the world. That's the contrast that makes us different from the world. That's what he says makes us shine like stars in the universe. Love that picture of what the attitude of Jesus in us looks like to the world. It looks like stars, points of light in a dark, depraved place. That's what we look like when we practice this poured out life. We fluoresce as we learned this summer. We fluoresce when we look like Jesus in a dark and depraved world. And the world needs this from us. Our ability to articulate the gospel, our ability to be believable, our ability to earn a hearing from skeptic people in a postmodern world, it's proportional to our gospel posture, our living, poured out lives. It's proportional to our humility, our selflessness, our self sacrificing attitudes. No one is going to be attracted to Jesus unless his people reflect his beauty accurately. But as we do that, as we reflect Jesus' beauty accurately, as we reflect his love and acceptance and grace and winsomeness actively, then we shine like stars in the universe. And the world needs that from us. You could argue now more than ever. So, uh, three reasons we live with we live a poured out life with gospel posture. One is because God expects it. The second is because the world needs it. 
And the third is because it's what others have done for us. And that we see in the second half of verse 16. Paul says, In order that I may boast on the day of Christ, that I did not run or labor for nothing. So, I mean, Paul's basically saying here, uh, living a poured out life. I I want you to live a poured out life. I want you to put the needs of others above your own rights and comforts. Uh, This is what I have done for you. And I would like to think that it made a difference. Paul says, I would like to think that it made a difference. I would hate to think that I put all this work in for you for nothing. And that's pretty honest. Really, they're, that's pretty honest. A lot of pastors would uh, like to be that direct with their people, you know, and say, please obey. Oh, please obey. I'd hate to think that uh, I put all, all this work in for nothing. Please make my life worth the sacrifices that I've made on your behalf. Now, I don't know that I could say that, but Paul uh, can say that. And, and he does. He says, I-, I want you to make it wor- so, that, so that I may boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor in vain, that I didn't do, go through all of this for nothing. But then he says, he'd do it again if, if he knew it would make a difference. That's what verse 17 says. Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice, or I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Basically, the line of thought goes something like this. Paul says, please live with gospel posture. Stay united as a church. Continue to advance the gospel in you and through you so that I will know I have not wasted my time with you. And if you will do this, it will make my poured out life worth it, and I would do it all over again. That's a, that's a pretty amazing thing for Paul to say, a pretty beautiful thing for him to say. And, and it reminds us that you and I are here because of the sacrifice and examples and ministry of other people who have lived poured out, humble, selfless lives. There are Pauls in your life who have worked hard to teach you, to disciple you, to pastor you, to walk with you. Uh, they're your mom or your dad. They're your uh, a Sunday school teacher or your youth pastor or uh, your grandparents or a small group leader or just a person who took interest in you, who involved themselves in your life and you know that God used them to help you come to know him. They poured their life into you. They put your needs and interests above their own. And and they showed a love for you that personifies a poured out life. And so it rests on you. It rests on me, uh, all of us, to live with gospel posture because that's how other people have lived with us. And so we have these three reasons that we're to continue this obedience that Paul's called us to, the obedient life of a poured out gospel posture. God expects it. It's just, it's simply living out the trajectory of our salvation. And God's given us everything we need to do that because he expects us to. It's his desire for us to accurately reflect him in the world. God expects it. Not only that, but the world needs it. The world is is, uh, dark and broken and hurting, and needs light. And to the degree that we reflect Jesus accurately, we are, we shine like stars in the universe. The world needs it. And finally, others have done this for us. We're here because of the poured out, humble, selfless lives of other people. So Paul challenges us to this kind of obedience, and then before we go, we have to look at One more thing, just briefly. We have to look at Paul's central description of gospel posture in this text. And that's right there in the middle of the passage. And we can't leave without saying something about it where Paul says, uh, do everything without complaining or arguing. The gospel posture that Paul is describing, uh, here here he describes it from kind of a negative point of view. Uh, earlier in, in verses 3 and 4, he talks about not, being, not having selfish ambition and, and uh, in humility considering others better than yourselves. But here he shows us, so that's what it does look like. 
Here in verse 14 is what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like complaining. It doesn't look like bitter, argumentative speech. So uh, this is what it, it, gospel posture is not. It is not toxic talk. It's not ga- uh, complaining and grumbling and, and uh, being uh, hard to please and being uh, continually dissatisfied with others and judgmental and critical. No. It is putting the needs of others above our own, caring for others, being gracious, not looking to our own interests, but each of us to the interests of the other. And uh, that is hard these days because uh, right now there is a lot to complain about. There is a lot, even for the body of Christ to complain about, a lot to disagree on. Uh, None of us see anything exactly the same or none of us see everything exactly the same. Whether it's politics or the coronavirus or uh, how to move forward as a church even. Uh, We all have at least slightly different takes on that and in some ways big different takes on that. And that difference... There's a lot to complain about. But that difference is all the more reason for us to remember the common bond that we have in Jesus. To remember that the truth that brings us together is much greater and much more important than these other smaller realities. And it's a reminder to us that being the body requires all of us to adopt an others-centered attitude. It requires all of us to live uh, poured out, humble selfless, sacrificial lives. This is the mindset that Jesus ministered with. It's the life he came and lived with. And as he did that, he brought glory to God. And in the same way, as we do that, despite the fact that we are differ on a lot of other things, with gospel posture, we don't complain, we don't argue, we're not argumentative, but instead we put the needs of others above our own. And as we do that, we bring honor to God We accurately reflect him in a world that desperately needs him. So uh, as we conduct ourselves with this kind of posture, uh, we do bring glory to God. We do bring the good news to the world. And we will be able to pass on the same gift to others that those ahead of us have, have passed on to us. That's the mindset that Jesus had. It's the poured out life that Paul lived. It's the life that he calls on us to live. And this is, this is what we desire for our church, what we desire for each of us, what I desire for you, what I desire for Trinity Bible Church. And so I'm glad that we have, uh, have had time and continue to have time to uh, simmer in this important truth. And I hope that over time it will just begin to really lodge itself into our mind that this is how we want to conduct ourselves. This is who we want to be. Trinity Bible Church. This is how we will accurately reflect God to the world. So that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me and for our church. I hope that uh, that uh, maybe is a reminder to you to pray this prayer for yourself and also to pray it for our church. So let's do that right now. Uh, Let's just ask God to help us as as we desire to practice the mindset of Jesus at Trinity Bible Church. Father, we come to you through the name of Jesus who uh, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And yet you raised him up because he uh, was your son and uh, he pleased you with with his uh, self-sacrifice. And because of that, uh, you've extended the offer of life to us. And we are thankful for that, that it's not something we've worked for or earned, but you've graciously given it to us through Jesus. And we know that you gave it to us, uh, not as a point in time uh, event, but as uh, something that you want to continue to unfold. You have a trajectory for us to become more and more like who we are. And that as we do that, the world will see Jesus in us. That is something we really want. We have a hard time sometimes, all of us, just sorting through our own attitudes and sorting through our own predispositions. And, and uh, we want to learn to be like Jesus, to put others first, to look out for the needs of others above our own. 
And uh, we're reminded that only you can do this in us. We're reminded today that, that it's only as you uh, create in us the, the desire and the, the, the ability that we can carry this out. But we ask for that, that you will increase our desire and that you will uh, enable us through your spirit that you will remind us of those times when we need to practice gospel posture. Help us to be increasingly mindful of this. And we ask that you'll carry it out. We need so much prayer right now, not just for our church, but for our country as we move into a very difficult time. And uh, we ask that you will watch over this country, that we'd be able to live lives that are uh, godly and peaceable. And we pray for the world that the church will be strong in the world, that the church will uh, look like gospel posture, that will look like Jesus in his mindset, and that through that we will shine like stars in this world, pointing people to your Son and to eternal life as we hold out the word of life. And we ask all this in Jesus' name through the enabling of your Spirit. Another great message from Pastor Brad. I'm really enjoying this Philippians um, sermon series, and I hope you are too. Remember, we are still memorizing that, that passage in the second chapter. So how far are you? Go ahead and tell us down below in the comments. Are you doing okay with that? Do you need some encouragement? Do you have any tips or tricks to memorizing? Let us know. Um, and before we go, as always, there are three ways that you can give. Uh, you can give by mail, text, or online, and all the information is right there on the screen for you. Thank you so much for giving and for um, just everything you do for us and the church here in Richardson. We love seeing what God does with what you give us. So as we go, I have a benediction for you from Philippians chapter 1. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.